Good evening. Welcome to Good Friday at Crossbridge. Uh, my name is Chris Dillashaw. I'm a pastor to students and families, uh, and I'm excited to be able to uh, lead us through our service tonight. We're not done worshiping. Brian and the guys will be back uh, with us uh, for us in a few minutes. Uh, but um, I just want to thank you for being here. It's, it's a great evening as we uh, pause in the busyness of a week, uh, in the busyness of a holiday season where family is in town, perhaps, uh, and we just uh, think about what was accomplished for us at the cross. And so um, I'm excited to be able to lead us through reading some passages of Scripture together. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with your Old Testament history, uh, but one thing that we do know is that in the Old Testament, there are about 300 or over 300 facts. We might call them prophecies about Jesus, about his birth, about his life, about his death, about his burial, and about his resurrection. Over 300 of these statements in the Old Testament. And when we read the Gospels, one of the greatest things about reading the Gospels, about reading the account of Jesus' life, is we get to see how each one of those prophecies are fulfilled. And specifically, um, there's about 100 of those 353 prophecies that are fulfilled in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And that is one of the reasons why we call Good Friday, Good Friday. Because as we get to be on this side of history and read the scriptures for ourselves, we get to see these, um, these prophecies fulfilled and they bring hope to our heart. And you see, one of the things that you need to understand about a prophecy um, as it's written in the Old Testament, and it gives us hope for how we see prophecy in the New Testament, is with each one of those facts, with each, each one of those ideas that we read about, about the person of Jesus, there comes a promise. There comes an idea that causes faith to grow in our hearts. And I'm praying that you might see that as we read the scriptures together tonight. I was standing in line this morning at the grocery store, uh, and I, I, I caught a glimpse of today's headlines. Um, and it's been a while since I picked up a newspaper, um, and so I was just really intrigued. Uh, and right up here in the upper corner, uh, you, you can't see it, but I'll just tell you, there's a picture of some people reenacting the passion of the Christ. And it's kind of tucked up there in the corner, and there is, there's, you know, there's a, a million other headlines in, in the paper. And I was really grateful that, um, that, good, that on Good Friday, Jesus made the front page. But you know what? Um, I, I flipped through the, the, I guess, 50 or so other pages in the New Testament, or I mean, not the New Testament, in the, in the Bible, uh, or I get it, did it again, there in the Express <laughs> News. Don't want to give them too credit, too much credit. <laughs> I flipped through uh, several of those pages, and I, I quickly discovered uh, that you won't find any other um, explanation about what is the power behind Good Friday, or what is the power behind Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And if you stop and think about it like this, these days that we are mindful of, these days that we are celebrating, they are the most important days in human history because of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And a lot like a newspaper, I think our lives, they crowd out what is really important. How we listen to the voice of God. How we remember what he accomplished for us. How we think about the person of Jesus. Because I know our lives, they're not, um, they're not a newspaper, but they, they have headlines written all over them, right? The things that we think about on a daily basis. The crisis that um, consume our lives. The family and friends that we have over and the jokes that they tell, there's a funny pages in there. You see, um, our lives kind of reflect, or the, the newspaper kind of reflects our lives. And I think it kind of reflects our lives as we might tuck the idea or the person of Jesus over in the corner and we're happy for him to make the front page, but there may not be a reflection of an experience with him that has changed our lives anywhere else in the pages of our lives. And so this evening, as we just read some scripture together, I want to just remind you about what was accomplished um, in the greatest days in human history. And we'll be taken back to some of those prophetic statements of Jesus, but not in terms of facts that help us actually believe, although I think that's what, one of the things that are accomplished. But tonight, I want you to see them as things in which Jesus endured. Circumstances in which he experienced on your behalf, on my behalf. 
And what is amazing, what, should, what really should make the front page of all of our lives is that, he, that there were statements made about him that he would endure these things a thousand years before he was ever to set foot on this earth. And so one of the ideas, one of the things that we see in the Old Testament is that Jesus came to deal with rejection. My guess is that in a room this size, there is someone in the room that's dealing with some form of rejection. And you might be surprised to know that over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth, the prophet Isaiah wrote this, that he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we esteem him not. He came to deal with rejection. And the promise that you see attached to that, we find actually in John chapter 1. When John wrote this, that he, Jesus, came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Prophecy fulfilled. But there's the promise, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, watch this. He gave the right to become the children of God. I don't know what you might be dealing with tonight, but maybe one of the headlines that is plastered all over your life is sorrow. Maybe you find yourself continually dealing with the pain and the loss that, is come to, that we have come to know in this life. And maybe it, for you, crowds out the voice of God. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, we read this, that surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs, that he's carried our our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by god and afflicted but when jesus was on this earth he said these words hey remember this that i have said these things everything that he was that was written about him recorded in the book he said them that we might have peace that we might have peace in this world He reminds us that we will have tribulation, but watch this tonight, church, that he said, take peace because I have overcome the world. I think there's another headline that I know people will be focused on in this Easter season, and that's the idea of punishment. I don't know what brought you to church tonight, but I know that in this season when we think about a a person that had to die, Whether we really believe it or not, it focuses my thoughts on who's going to pay for my sins. Who's going to pay for the things that I have done wrong? I think maybe the headline and the byline for you might be, Hey, is is God real and could he really possibly love me? Chris, you might not be able to make the next statement you're about to make if you've known, if you know everything that I've ever done. But tonight... Jesus wants to speak into your life this reminder that he was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. And upon him, the very God of the universe laid a chastisement that brought us peace. And because of his wounds, we are healed. But the best part of the verse, the best part of the passage is verse 6. It reminds me that all of us have gone astray. We're like sheep. Each of us have turned every one to our own way, but the Lord laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. That means that the punishment that was intended for you, that was intended for me, why it's a good Friday is that it was laid on Jesus that day. Listen to how the Apostle Peter describes what was gained for us at the cross, that on a tree like this, he himself, he Jesus, bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed tonight maybe you need to realize that the voice of of god speaks into your life to tell you that you can receive for free the very righteousness of god i think the next two are huge we realize that um in a quiet moment that Uh, There might be a theme to our lives, a a, a title, uh, a front page headline that says you're a disobedient son son or daughter. You, You stand in judgment or God stands in judgment over you. Words that really no one wants to hear. 
and expectations that come to our mind when we think about this season. Um, And I want you to remember this, that one of the things that was foretold about Jesus hundreds of years before he ever walked the face of this earth is that he came to bring an end to disobedience and to judgment. Isaiah 53 again says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, that like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is, uh, that is before its shears when it is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You know, around 3 or 4 a.m. on that very first Good Friday, Jesus was taken before, or he was tried before the high priests, Ananias and and, and, and Caiaphas. And the Gospels tell us that he did not speak a word, that he was silent. Even when he was falsely accused, they brought liar after liar in front of this tribunal to accuse him of things, and he never once opened his mouth to to defend himself. And you see, on that day, he secured something for you. He secured something for me. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans what exactly was accomplished for us. That God, when he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Hang on, it gets better. Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who shall bring any charge against a believer? Because it is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but more than that, who was raised again from the grave, who is right now at the right hand of God the Father, And right now is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Paul continues reminding us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On that tree 2,000 years ago, Jesus purchased for you a payment for your sins, but he also purchased for you what would be credited into your account as the very righteousness of God. So no matter what the headlines of your life are today, what might be crowding out the voice of God, whether it's the fear of rejection, whether it's overwhelming sorrow, whether it's the idea that you're a disobedient son or daughter, whether you think God stands in judgment over you or wants to punish you, you can know this, that Jesus has already dealt with each one of those things. Not only did he deal with them to make sufficient payment for them, he experienced them on your behalf. He went through those things with humanity on his mind as to reclaim the glory of God for all people so that we could have our right identity as sons and daughters of God. But that's not all. You see, if we had time tonight, we could continue down the list of these 100 things that Jesus accomplished in the last 48 hours. You see, it was foretold that he would deal with criticism, and he dealt with it. It was foretold that he would deal with the guilt of all humanity, and oh my goodness, did he ever deal with it. It was foretold that he would deal with sickness, with all things that tear this body down, and yes, even sickness has been dealt with. It was foretold that he would deal with poverty, with rebellion, pain, violence. And along with those, it was also foretold that he would deal with persecution and hatred, grief and oppression. Each one of those has a prophecy tied to it and a New Testament corresponding passage that you could look up tonight if we had time and see how in the last 48 hours Jesus dealt with each one of those things. And my friends, it wasn't merely just to check the box of a factual thing. He endured those experiences so that, as the Bible tells us, that we would have a Savior that understands and is compassionate in every situation that we face. So the question on Good Friday is, not actually what did Jesus accomplish. It's plain before us. The real question, I think, is, 
Why doesn't this reflect my daily life, my daily experience, and my daily, uh, the way my daily relationship with Jesus looks like? How I experience him. And I come full circle to my newspaper experience this morning because wrapped around this front page is really what kind of caught my attention. And it was this. An advertisement for a free extreme coupon workshop. Right there. And I am the dad of two daughters, and I am tired of spending $8 on mascara. And so I was really interested if I could find out how to save some money on some makeup. And you see, uh, I searched this, and you know, the idea of a coupon, I think, um, is really easy. Some of them are digital, some of them are still in print like this on a newspaper, but the idea behind a coupon is really kind of easy to understand, right? There's a vendor, there's a person out there that has a good or a service that you want to have or receive. And so you clip the coupon, and you take some money that you have, and you take it to that person, and you redeem the coupon, and you get what you wanted. And you see, the flaw in that understanding, as we might think about it on Good Friday, is that the central figure in that transaction is me. It's my responsibility to clip the coupon. It's my responsibility to go look in between the cushions on the couch and find enough change to make the transaction happen. The central figure in, in an extreme coupon clipping workshop is me. And 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago, the central figure on what was redeemed for you was not you. It was Jesus. And you see, what he accomplished for us doesn't require any coupon clipping. It doesn't require really any effort than you bringing your life to Jesus. Because what was accomplished on the cross was payment and full for these things. And tonight... My prayer is that you will have seen with your very own eyes a set of scriptures. And that as we prepare our hearts to receive the elements of the Lord's Supper, that you will remember that these things have already be, been paid in full. And what's really required is me just to say, uh, well, you know what, Lord, here's my heart. Let me receive all that you have for me today. Would you pray with me? God, I'm thankful that... We can count on it. It's been paid in full. And that the central figure of the transaction that paid that in full was you, Jesus. And tonight, as we remember that, I pray that you would soften our hearts in such a way that we would respond to you, that we would bring glory to your name as we remember what you have accomplished for us. As we remember the central person in that transaction was you in the single most important time period in history. And tonight, Lord Jesus, we honor you by remembering that. We honor you by laying all of this at the foot of the cross. We pray by the power of your spirit that you would help us not take up rejection anymore. Lay down grief and despair and sorrow and judgment and guilt Criticism, rebellion, punishment, sickness, disobedience, persecution, hatred, pain, and violence. Lay there at the foot of the cross and take up the very righteousness of Christ. The very righteousness offered to us as that free gift. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray and believe. Amen.